So today we are going to talk about waste in understanding society. And I'm Olena Kaminska. I've been working on waste for understanding society for the last 10 years. And all the weights you um, see on the data set uh, of UKHLS and IP Innovation Panel have been created by me. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about four main topics um, that a lot of users are interested in. First of all, should we use weights? And what happens if you don't? Second, how do you select a correct weight for your analysis? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced topics. So we have some users who are worried about zero weights and they select um, our data set, they um, run the analysis and realize that some cases are dropped because of zero weights. So we're going to talk about it, whether it's a problem, whether you need to be worried about it and what you can do about it. And finally, I'm going to talk about how you can create your own tailored weight for your analysis. Okay, first, should you use weights? The answer is yes, definitely. This is the easiest way to represent the population with our data set. So, uh, in addition to weights, to any statistical software you use, you need to specify a cluster variable in the situation a PSU. A uh, weight variable, this is one example, do in stata it needs to be p-weight, and strata variable for stratification. This is the three things you need to specify to a software, and based on that, as long as you use a 3 by column and you run your analysis, you the software will need uh, will know everything it needs to know about how we collected data, about the selection probabilities, about non-response. You don't need to worry about it. You can concentrate on your topic of research just with um, telling clustering weights and stratification to the software. You will be able to concentrate on your research and not worry about anything else. Now, what happens if you don't use weights? So this is an example. Let's say you want to look at the proportion of the population. This is zero plus, uh, and you want to estimate it from wave eight of other data set. If you don't use weights, this is the proportions you get. Basically, especially in England and Northern Ireland, the proportion is quite off. So let's see at the weighted results. The weighted results are much closer to the population estimates. So basically our data is designed to be used with weights. Now let's have a look at another question, and this is an example of an opinion question. Generally, so this is um, a question about how people voted in the general election of 2017 in the UK. And the data comes from wave 8, um, but it's not the full wave. Uh, it's asked of people who participated in July and December 2017. And the, the results also exclude Northern Ireland. So generally, when we um, look at the different questions, we often can compare the factual questions to the population statistics, but it's extremely rare that we have opinion questions from the population statistics and election questions whom you have voted for in the last election is one of very very few questions we can actually have a population statistics for so because people go and vote express their opinion and we have the record of that we know the election results so if you use unweighted data you see that we would think that UK is quite, has quite a lot of labor um, favorites, you know, they like labor. The difference between conservatives and labor is very big. Let's have a look at the weighted results. They are much, much closer to, the, to what happened in the general election. So you would say, 
There are some analyses published without weights, what you should think about it. And actually, what happens if you run your analysis without weights? Well, my response to that is it may be close to the truth. It may be not close to the truth. It may be a little bit off. It may be quite a lot off. But you will not know. Until you run your results with weights, you will not know. And going back to this general election question, whom you voted for, imagine you didn't have population results. Imagine all you had is answers to our data, in our data set. And this is what made most of the questions that our users study. Um, this is our situation. We don't have population statistics. That's why we use survey data, because that's a means to estimate them. Um, and what happens is that if you only look at unweighted results, you will be writing a paper telling that, look, UK is favors Labour quite a lot, it's in, in, and Conservatives is much farther away in favouring. So the difference is around 12 percentage points, it's very big, um, and so this is the way UK is. And if we didn't know the true results, you'll be writing this paper. And what the risk in writing such a paper with unweighted results is that you will have a colleague looking at your paper, thinking, hmm, let me reanalyze this data using weights, finding that the actual, you know, the actual results are very different to how you described them, and saying, actually, the paper you published with unweighted results is misleading, the actual results are such and such, and the actual situation is different, and your conclusions are wrong. This is what you don't want to do. So, um, if you actually ever considered publishing unweighted results, my suggestion is at least run weighted results for yourself, at least know your risk, and I would at least put weighted results in the footnote. Um, but ideally, you want to have results that represent the population, and you would want to use both weights and, and clustering and stratification. OK. So our data set is designed for multiple purpose. It's complex, and we have a lot of weights. So I'm going to talk in this section about how to select a weight for your analysis. If you open a data set like INDRESP, um, if you scroll all the way down, in the very end of the data set you will see weights. And in this situation we have a lot of weights. These are longitudinal, these are cross-sectional. There are lots of them. So how do you know which weight to choose? You need to answer a few questions to, and these answers to these questions will um, fill in the name of the weight, which consists of five different parts. So in the following section, I'm going to uh, go through these questions and see uh, and show you how you can fill this bit of the name of the weight. First, think about your analysis. Are you using one wave? So is it one time point? Are you using multiple waves and are you looking at the change over time? And so if it's change over time, you're looking at longitudinal data and you will be using um, underscore LW weight. And if it's cross-sectional, it's going to be a underscore XW. Next, think about the waves you are using in your analysis. If you are looking at cross-sectional analysis from wave 9, for example, your weight will be corresponding to I and will be I underscore. Now, if you are looking at the longitudinal analysis, think about the last wave of your analysis. And if you are looking, for example, at all waves starting at 1 and ending at 9, uh, last wave of your analysis will be wave 9 and it will be I underscore. Next, think about whom you study. So if you're 
um, analysis is as a at a household level. So, for example, you're looking at the proportion of households in the UK with particular characteristic. You are going to use HHD. If you are looking at people, but zero plus, or you're looking at adults or any um, age people, but you're looking at all your questions come from household questionnaire and they can be found in indoor. It's PSN here. If you are studying youth and your questions come from youth questionnaire, it's YTH. And if it's for adults, 16 plus, and your questions come from INDRASP, it's IND. Okay, next, we have um, a number of different instruments uh, for adults. And so, if you are looking, um, if you are studying adults, think about where these questions come from. If all your questions are asked in main questionnaire as well as to proxies, it's BX. If all your questions are asked in main questionnaire but are not, not asked to proxies, it's IN. If questions are asked in self-completion questionnaire, it's SC. If your questions come from nurse visit, it's NS. And if your questions come from blood samples, then it's BD. And we have also five extra minutes questionnaire. These questions are asked to ethnic minority groups, but also a representative small example of general population. This is 5M. Okay, but you will tell me, in my analysis, I'm using a number of different instruments. For example, I'm using questions from household level, but I'm also looking at questions um, that are asked to proxy and main interview, and some questions are, come from self-completion interview. That's fine. So use this table, and then, you know, um, have a mental take on the levels that you use and always use the weight from the lowest with the lowest number. So if you if two is the lowest in this example, your weight will come from self-completion and um, for is for self-completion interview. Another example is for example you will be using information for household level, main interview, from nurse visit, but also information from blood. Then you then uh, your weight will be from blood, um, will be tailored to blood and will be BD. So always use the lowest level of analysis. Okay, next, this is also related to waves you are using, but this is um, slightly different. So think about the waves you are using and if it's any wave six or onwards, you will be using UI weight. Um, for example, if your analysis is using wave 9, so you can use your I cross-sectional weight. If you're in your analysis, you're studying a change between wave 8 and 9, this will be also your I weight. But if your analysis starts at wave 2 um, or any time afterwards, you can use your B weight. If it starts at way one, it's your S weight. If it starts in 2001, it's zero one weight. And if it starts in 1991, it's 91 weight. Now, there is a little bit of um, a hint I have for you. If you are interested in the largest number we have, it's best to start at wave six. If you are interested in ethnic minorities, so wave six or wave two would be a good start, or wave one. Um, if you are interested in studying Northern Ireland but going as far away, uh, as far ago as possible, zero one weight is good. If you are interested in studying Scotland and Wales separately as uh, subgroups, you uh, you would also use zero one weight. If you want to look at Great Britain and you want to go as far back as possible, you would go for 
1991. And if you want high sample size for Great Britain or, or for UK, you may want to start at wave one or wave, wave two. Okay, now we are going to slide some of um, more advanced topics and I, I met users who told me they want high sample size but they noticed that when they look at our data some cases are dropped because of zero weights. There are, um, so, there are some reasons we have zero weights. Some are by design and some are because how we calculate our weights. So to start with we have temporary sample members. These are people who move in into our households uh, where we have original sample member who we selected at day one and they are there um, so we ask them questions but they are not part of the longitudinal sample by design so their longitudinal weights are zero. Note their cross-sectional weights are positive because we use weight share method but a lot, a lot of the reason why we interview them is that they provide very valuable information about household and context for other um, longitudinal sample members. What's unusual about understanding society, and this is related to its complex sample design, is that we have TSMs from way one. Um, this doesn't happen normally in other household panels. So this is slightly unusual, and in other household panels, you will see that way one weight everyone gets, and it's positive for everyone, but not in understanding society. So who are these? These are the people who uh, lived uh, in EMB or IMB households, but they are not eligible for these samples. So EMB is ethnic minority boost and IMB is immigration and ethnic minority boost. Happen they happened in Bay 1 and 6. And as part of them, we were interested in boosting specifically ethnic minorities. But of course, ethnic minorities, some of them live with um, people who are not ethnic minorities, or who are not uh, eligible for this sample. And they were still interviewed to provide the context of the household, but because the way they were selected, they will always have a zero weight. Basically, the selection probability into our panel um, is zero, and that's what weights reflect. So if you ever get a weight, if someone creates a weight for you, that doesn't have zero values at all, be very cautious because most likely it's not correct. Um, then we have longitudinal waves and they assume participation in all waves. So we do have zero weights for anyone who missed at least one wave. And we have cross-sectional weights that currently require household participation in all waves, although this requirement is not very strict. So for example, your I weight um, doesn't require participation in waves 3, 4, and 5. Um, now, do you need to worry about zero weights? And so here I'm providing an example what happens and which effect zero weights have on your analysis. In this situation, imagine you want to estimate a proportion of natural adoptive stepmothers of a child under 16, and I'm using wave 8 here. What I find is that there are 33,818 people who have positive weight. But total number in the data set is 39,000. So technically, you're using over 5,000 people. Should you worry about it? So to demonstrate the effect of this, I, what I did, I used these 33,818 people. They have positive weights. And I randomly selected different numbers from out of this sample and estimated this proportion and showed you the estimate and standard error and confidence interval. So imagine 
you selected 20 people. What happens? Your estimate is 19%, but the confidence interval is really big. And so it ranges anywhere from 0 to 40%. This is big, but then the sample size is very small. Let's imagine you have 50 people. What happens? So the estimate goes down to 13.9. And confidence interval is much smaller, but still rather wide. It's somewhere between 4% and 24. OK, let's move to 100 people. Your estimate is now 10.6. And confidence interval is somewhere between 4 and 17.2. Let's add another 400 people. So now we have 500. Your estimate is now 14.6. Your confidence interval is narrower. Let's go to 1,000. Your estimate is now 13.8. So it stabilizes. And confidence interval is now narrower, somewhere between 11.3 and 16.4%. Well, we have now 1,000 people. Let's see what, we, what happens if you have 5,000 people. The estimate doesn't change much. The confidence interval goes down, so is narrower. OK, another 5,000 people. Estimate doesn't change. And the confidence interval is narrower. But actually, the advantage of 5,000 people is not that big. Well, let's go and add 10,000 people more. Look, the estimate almost didn't change. And confidence interval, if you compare, it's 12.5 here, 12.6 here, it's 14% and 13.6 here. So now it is one percentage points wide. And it didn't change here. What happens if you add another 10,000? Well, it doesn't change. And here, it, you know, the confidence interval barely changed as well. So if you Imagine you add another 10,000. You will be at around 40,000 here. What do you think will happen to the estimate? It will not change much, probably. And imagine what will happen to the confidence interval. It will get narrower, but by how much? Not that much. What happens if a user says, well, actually, I'm worried about this 5,000 people. Now I'm going to use everyone I have because I'm going to get maybe a better estimate. What happens then? So he uses all the people, even though those who have zero weight, and uses unweighted estimates. He gets 15% uh, as an estimate, and he gets this confidence interval. What I see as a problem is that his confidence interval doesn't include the weighted estimate at all. So it's likely that his estimate is biased. And the confidence interval, it's so biased that even confidence interval doesn't include the weighted estimate. So what do you, what do you gain from unweighted estimate? Well, you gain a bias and a few extra people. Let's have a look at the same, so this is the same table, but it expressed in a graph. And so these are the sample sizes that we're talking about. This is 20, 30, and so forth, going to 33,818. And what happens, this is the estimate of the proportion of mothers. This is a confidence interval. So what I want to show you is that it's, the estimate is very volatile and fluctuates a lot up until 500 probably. With 1,000, it stabilizes and really doesn't change anything on, you know, from 5,000 onwards or maybe from 1,000 onwards. The confidence interval is really big with small numbers, but goes down quite quickly. And maybe at 500, it's already quite narrow. At 1,000, it's very narrow. And after 5,000, really, you don't gain much. If you gain um, more people, you don't gain much in your estimate and in confidence interval. 
So my suggestion to you, if you are anywhere here in your sample size, so 1,000 plus, 5,000 plus, get in another 10,000, don't change your results. And definitely not worth um, not using weights just for the sake of having more people in your analysis. Now, if you are anywhere here between, you know, under 300, yes, you may want to consider some alternative options. So some people would say, I still want more in terms of sample size. And my suggestion to you is first analyze our data with our weights as a first step and have a look at it. If you have, doesn't matter which sample size you have, if your results are significant, just go and publish that. If you have small sample size in your subgroup, and your result is still significant, it's perfect. You probably have an important big effect and it's worth publishing it. Don't worry about anything else. Use weights, publish. Now, if your results with our weights are not significant, but the p-value is large, let's say it's 0.6, it's unlikely that adding 10, 20% of a sample will make this p-value below 0.5. It's, you know, you can add a lot of sample size, but it's probably going to stay um, not significant. So I wouldn't try to um, just not use weights or even do anything with weights. I would actually try to think about why is my effect not as big as I was expecting. Now, if your p-value is marginal, so let's say your p-value is 0 0.08, this is a situation where it's worth considering tailored weighting, which can help you with sample size. It can bring us a 10, 20% sample um, back. But keep in mind that it's a big exercise, and in the end, you may still get the same p-value of 0.08. That may be what it is, maybe not, you know, an effect, an important effect, but not a, that big. But before you complain about sample size, what about sample size, just do this, these steps first. Run our data with veins. And this brings me to tailored veins. There are three reasons why you would want to do tailored veins, and the first I already mentioned. So this is a sample size. You may gain a little bit in sample size. Second, you, um, there are situations where users use very unusual combination of our instruments. In this situation, we won't have a weight for you. And um, this may be a very good reason why you can create your own tailored weight for your analysis. And um, there is sometimes, so a third reason to use tailored weights is when, and there are some users who want specific predictors in their weighting um, model, uh, or they don't want a specific predictor in the weighting model. So for example, they don't want gender in any of the weighting model to appear. So in this situation, you can create your own weights. The positive point about it is that we provide everything to enable you to create your own weights, so it is possible. On the other hand, it is complex. And suddenly, all of this magic of the weights, that you don't need to worry about the um, data, how the data was collected, all the selection probabilities, all the little things um, that influence weights and probabilities and non-response, you, you didn't need to worry before when you used weights. Now you need to worry about it. You need to take everything into account correctly. And um, you need to be very careful that you don't miss any bit out. So if you actually want to create your own tailored weight, my suggestion and the easiest way to do it is to start with one of our weights. For example. You may be studying 
um, a longitudinal analysis of the change between V1 and 9. So you don't care about anything that happened between these waves, you just are interested in V1 and V9. So what you can do is you can start with V1 weight and you can model V9 response conditional on V1. Another example is you may want to study a change between wave 8 and 9. So I would suggest in this situation to start with our wave 6 issue weight and model a joint wave 8 and 9 response conditional on wave 6 positive weight. And third, this is an example with different instruments. For example, you are studying use aspirations at wave 1 and what actually happened to them when they were adults at wave 9. So in this situation, and there are different opportunities here, but you will be using use questions at wave 1 and main questionnaire at wave 9. And um, we don't have a specific weight for this unusual combination of the instruments. But there are a few different ways weights you can start with, and for example, you can start with the numerated weight at weight 9, and then, conditional on that, you would um, model a joint response to use questionnaire at weight 1 and main questionnaire at weight 9, conditional on this weight. Okay. In general, if you want to create your own weight, I suggest you do your own attrition adjustment, it's much easier, and you again start with our um, weight, weight. So if you want to, to do your own attrition adjustment, you can start at wave 1 uh, using our cross-sectional weight, you can start at wave 2 or 6 using the, respect, the, the, the issue weights that we created for you. In this situation, you would use predictors that are already available in the data set uh, from wave 1, 2, and 6, respectively. And you do need to remember to also take into account newborns, death, moving out of the country, becoming 16, and mortality adjustment, among others. And remember, you can also create your own cross-sectional weight through a weight share. Okay, let's say you're ambitious and you want to create your own weights from scratch. This is possible and we provide all the information you would need for this. This is um, not necessarily easy and um, I'm going to tell you, to talk to you uh, through the steps we take to create our weights to give you a little introduction how you can do that. So first of all, the weight is a reciprocal of the probability. And the probability that goes into weight consists of three probabilities. The selection probability, probability of response in wave 1, and probability of response since from wave 1 onwards. So that's the um, opposite of attrition. So the product of these three create the total probability, and if you uh, divide 1 over this probability, you get the total weight. So this is a simple situation, and it would be true for our GPS, the general population sample, also for BHPS 1991 sample. It becomes a little bit more complex if you look at um, all the samples in our analysis. So this um, graph represents all the samples, and let's say if you are looking at wave 9, these are all the samples that feed into it. And so from a statistical point of view and from sampling selection point of view, this is how I think about it. We have three countries selected, so a sample in 91 was selected in three countries. We had a boost of Scotland and Wales in 99, Northern Ireland started in 2001. We got general population sample in four countries, that's UK HLS start, and um, 
ethnic minority boost in three countries, and then we got immigrant and ethnic minority boost in the three countries, and these are the immigrants who moved into the household with our original sample members. So all of these samples are combined. So why is that important? For each person that is in the sample, we need to figure their probability to be selected through each single sample and to have participated up until points that you are studying, so in the situation will be wave 9. So for example, imagine an Indian who moved into this country in 1990 and he moved to the Northern Ireland, so let's say he moved to London, he lived in London until 2000, moved to Northern Ireland in 2000, moved back in 2005, let's say, to London again. So for such a person, he could have been selected in, so let's say he was selected in IMB here, but actually he could have been selected in 91 in London, he couldn't be selected through Scottish and Welsh boost, but he could have been selected through Northern Ireland example in 2001 because he was in Northern Ireland at that time. He moved back to London, remember, in 2005. So let's say he could have been selected in 2009 in London, but he also could have been selected in through ethnic minority boost um, in London as well uh, separately. Then he could have been selected through IMB in 2014-15 example as well. Now, all of these um, probabilities need to be combined because he was could have been sampled through e each of them. But also, it's not only the probability, what we need to think about is his chance to not only be sampled here, but also to respond through all of these years up until this point. And if he was selected in 91, you know, the attrition is so much bigger over these years than if he was selected in 2014-15. The attrition is smaller over the three first years of the sample. Mm -hmm. So, uh, non-response probability is separately cal calculated for each of these samples as well. Now, moving forward, we have basically for each person 17 selection probabilities. And they are combined by adding them because these are joint probabilities. So the design weight consists of 17 selection probabilities. They are currently released and you can use them if you want to um, construct your own weights, for example. Now, the actual weight that is um, released is a combination of 34 um, parts so 17 probabilities multiplied each by a respective response probability. And this probability of response consists of two parts, which is wave one, a response and attrition correction. Okay, so if you want to start with selection probabilities, um, in addition to the previous slides that you need to remember also that we have a one non-response and it's not negligible. Some people say I'm going to start with design weight because design weights are provided, it's easy and I'm going to correct for non-response but what they think about is the attrition. Attrition is easy to correct for because you start at wave one and Way one has all the predictors that you may be interested in. It's rich in information, and then you model it, um, and you model your response based on way one. But don't don't forget about non-response at way one. What's the issue with it? The problem that if you want to correct for non-response, you need to have predictors for both respondents and non-respondents. So for way one, you need to have predictors for all the sampled households, that both the, the ones that responded and also the, those that didn't respond. So what we did is we, we I had access to a postcode and small 
area indicators and I linked them to external geographical data sets, census, but also a number of other ones. And I obtained these predictors for our sample and I use them to control for this non-responsive way one. So um, my suggestion is if you are going this route and you want to create your own ways, do remember about wave one non-response. This will be additional step for you to link our data to external sources so that you have these predictors and Remember that correcting just for attrition using design weights is not enough because basically you'll be correcting only for around 20% of non-response or total non-response and that's not sufficient. Okay, the main point from this presentation is to remember that weights are like a magic wand. You use, um, you, you tell a software, statistical software, what the weight is and you don't need to worry about how the data was collected by selection probabilities and joint selection probabilities. You don't need to worry about non-response. You don't need to worry about linking our data to external sources to correct for non-response. You also don't need to worry about things like eligibility, um, be corrected for non-eligibility for ethnic minority boost, for be correct for mortality, and be correct for and we give correct weights for new entrances such as newborns and rising 16s. All of these you don't need to worry about. This job is done for you. What you need, what, what I hope you do is you spend your time on your topic of research and you just tell when you use our data, you tell the software this is a clustering variable, this is the weight, this is stratification, give me the representative um, results to, of our population. So remember weights are magic wand and your only task is to select the correct weight. Now if you have further questions on the weights you can use our user guide. Uh, the way we calculated weights is described um, in details there. Um, we also have user support forum if you have a question, check the support forum first. A lot of people have asked questions before you and we have answered them. So it's very useful as, um, a place to look at. You can also ask a question there and we will be able to answer it. You can also email to us or you can ask to have a help desk hour where we talk to you and we answer your question via um, a video conference. Uh, finally, there is a separate um, video on how to select a correct weight. You can also watch it. <laughs>